Well, hello everyone. Thank you so very much for tuning in. As you can see, I have a very special guest, Robert Cheek, who I would call the OG of vegan bodybuilding, someone who you've probably heard of and someone who you may have some questions for. So Robert, thanks so much for coming on today. Thank you, Gabriel. I appreciate you having me. Good to see you today. Hey, it's great to see you. And uh, in, in all the craziness that's going on around the world, you are someone who is, uh, you know, as I'm trying to be, and I see you being it as, as, a, as a beacon of light out there, sharing positivity and, and really helping others, which is, we need a lot more of that in the world around us for sure. Uh, yeah, it's a tough time right now. And I think that's the best thing we can do is put our best selves forward. And one of the, the greatest shows of strength, I think, is reaching down and, and lifting others up, you know, whether that's other people who are struggling, lifting animals up, it's, you know, contributing compassion and kindness to the world around us. Uh, I think that's, that's the best use of the 1,440 minutes we have every day, because consider the alternative, consider just being down or, or, or sad or bummed out. And there's plenty of reasons to feel that way. But if we can just uh, hone in on the things that bring us the most joy, which is often helping others or doing things for others that brings us a sense of fulfillment and happiness and joy and then the, the tangible things like like exercise you know like like exercise and fresh air and good healthy food those types of things obviously can help uh bring about a, a more joyful experience and so so yeah it's it, absolutely a tough time for a lot of people and uh, i think the best thing we can do is lead by positive example and, and try to shine a little bright light on on the rest of the world most certainly. I am uh, 100% in agreement there. Well, Robert, why don't we, uh, I know I've got, a, I've got a good amount of questions. I know our, our viewers have, have kind of circled around and have some good questions that I'll hopefully be able to pontificate to you. Um, but, but let's get a little bit of a background. When did you start eating plant-based? When did you decide to cut animals out of, your, out of your diet? And then how did that transform into wanting to be a bodybuilder? Or maybe you want to do that beforehand. So give a little bit of background for our, for our listeners. Yeah, thanks, Gabriel. Well, actually, I, I share a similar background to you, where I grew up in an agriculture uh, community, an animal agriculture community. In fact, my father was a professor at Oregon State University for, I don't know, 35 years as a world expert in animal agriculture. He wrote 15 textbooks, traveled to six continents. Uh, he's retired now, still living out in Corvallis, Oregon, where I'm from. And, you know, growing up, he was traveling from continent to continent, country to country, bringing back souvenir t-shirts. But what he was doing was teaching people around the globe how to raise rabbits for food and raise other animals, but his specialty was rabbits. And so I grew up in a farming background. In fact, I raised animals on our farm. We had dairy cows, horses, ponies, goats, turkeys, chickens, rabbits, uh, guinea pigs, I mean, you know, all kinds of different animals, uh, uh, just uh, pigs and sheep we didn't have but pretty much everything else. And so I raised animals at the county fair and the state fair. And, you know, eventually when I was a teenager, my older sister became a uh, vegetarian and vegan. And I didn't really know what that was, but she just didn't want to cause harm to animals anymore. And so, you know, I was a small kid. I, I wanted to be bigger and stronger. You know, I grew up watching He-Man and, and Captain Planet. You know, I was a kid of the eighties and the early nineties. And I mean, that was true. I mean, I was, I weighed 89 pounds in eighth grade. I still have my medical form that shows my height and weight and all that. I was a small kid, you know, and I, I wanted to be bigger and stronger. But then I got into animal rights and decided not to show animals at 4-H or certainly not sell them at the auction anymore. And I started participating in animal rights events back in December of 1995. I was 15 years old. And at this point, I weighed uh, about 120 pounds. And I still had this desire to get bigger and stronger. And I wondered if I could. And so I asked my older sister, I mean, that's who you look up to, right? I mean, the, my inspiration for this whole thing. I said, you know, can I really get bigger and stronger without meat, milk, and eggs? And she said, basically, Robert, you know, it's, it's not that you need meat, milk, and eggs to build muscle and gain size and strength. It's that you need the nutrition that's commonly associated with those things. You know, you need protein and you need vitamins, minerals, and, and overall good nutrition to accomplish that. So... I set out to do that, and I, uh, so I just continued on with my vegan journey. I was a five-sport athlete, uh, not a football player like you. I was uh, more of a runner and soccer player and basketball player and wrestler and all that, and I eventually ran uh, one year uh, cross-country at Oregon State University, and then I checked in right here. You know, what do I really want to do? Like, what, like what makes me happy? 
And running was a big part of that, but I also wanted to get bigger and stronger, like I said. So I started lifting weights. And before you knew it, I put on 30 pounds in a year on a plant-based diet. And within the, the next year or two, was a competitive vegan bodybuilder and had about a 10-year uh, vegan bodybuilding career. And then went on to uh, re retire around age 30 and write books for the last 10 years about the subject. Awesome. No, that's... that's, that's uh... It's it's amazing how much similarity there are between a lot of people in this space, right? I I like to say I have a four year degree in breeding, feeding, fattening, slaughtering, slicing, serving every animal old McDonald ever dreamed of, right? It's not something I'm proud of, but that's my background. I an ag background and going to college for livestock production is a big part of it. And 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 you you and many others have had similar backgrounds to where it's not so much that we. We're, we're, we hate the people who are doing these things to the animals. We just realize that it's a lot of times unnecessary, pretty much always unnecessary, and there's just a better way. And so uh, we all we can all focus our energy on different things. You did bodybuilding, and, and it's uh, it's been great to it's been great to see and follow. And and here's here's a question, and I will get into definitely the hey, I want to be the next robert cheek or the next nime delgado or the next what the, whoever the next vegan bodybuilder the next yeah. going to or arnold Washington. and yeah go going to mr olympia and doing all this stuff or miss all the all the different the the the, the extreme there's the extreme end yeah. but for the other 99.9 percent .9 of our listeners and viewers who just want to get fit they just want to put on some muscle they they've never They've never felt like they, they really stand out in the gym or they want to go to the beach and, and, and look good. Sure. Where are some, some simple things, right? They're, they're hopefully eating a whole food plant-based or a vegan diet, and, and they're just looking for ways to, to build that or to, to utilize that to, to help with their physique. Not to be the next Mr. or Miss Physique, but to just look good when they're going out is the big question that everybody has. Yeah. So the Gabriel, the first thing is to be aware of what you're doing with your time. You know, uh, oftentimes if we ask someone, so tell me about your current uh, nutrition program, tell me about your current uh, training program, you know, what's a day in the life like for you? Most of us will, will provide an answer that is completely inaccurate because we remember the things we want to remember and we conven conveniently forget about the things we don't really want to remember. So we remember the times we ate a salad and give ourselves a pat on the back, you know, because we feel good about that. We remember the times we take our dog for a walk because when we don't, we feel a little bit guilty or a little bit bad or that we didn't prioritize as well. Uh, we feel good when we go to the gym. In fact, we go as far as to post it on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Hey, look what I did today. I worked out. Okay, great. Well, what about yesterday? What about the day before? What about the day before? And so I think what we have to do is, is audit ourselves uh, sincerely and authentically, but also with uh, kindness to ourselves. I mean, be, hold ourselves accountable, but not be hard on ourselves. So, I mean, I've had to do that all throughout my career. I've had ups and downs in, uh, you know, in, in my physique, in my uh, abilities in the gym, uh, going through injuries or up, ups and downs or changing interests and doing other things where I've gone uh, kind of the opposite of you. I actually put on just about 100 pounds um, on a plant-based diet. Of course, I started pretty small, 120, and I, I've peaked at 217. I'm about 212 or so right now. Um, but along that journey, I felt all types of different emotions. Like Even like you said, people who just want to feel a little bit more energetic or feel a little bit more fit or be a little more active. I've been all of those stages. And even after being a champion bodybuilder, I had to become a beginner again after herniating some discs in my lower back and they couldn't exercise at all for five months and was really, really slow to get around. And so the first thing to do is to evaluate what, what you're doing on a day by day basis. And, and really what I suggest, and it doesn't take a lot of work, is just to document what you do as far as nutrition and exercise for an entire week. The reason I say a week is because anyone can alter their behavior for a single day or for two days, like I'm gonna put up my best foot forward. I wanna show Gabriel or, or, or Chef AJ or whoever is watching that I am you know, doing the best work. But that's not always an accurate representation of, of who we are on a long-term you know, long scale. So give yourself a week to, uh, to evaluate what your exercise routine is really like, what your nutrition is really like, and then from there, you can make conscious decisions to make improvements. Perfect. No, I think the, the audit is a, a wonderful step because a lot of us want to want to believe that our life looks one way and we can tell that story and tell that story until we're blue in the face. But uh, if we're really not living it, then 
then there's not going to be any results from it. Right. So we've done the audit. We've, we, we've said, all right, you know what? I realized that I'm, uh, I realized my, my phone's gone off a few times. I apologize about that, Robert. But, uh, but, but so I realized I've done the audit and now I'm ready to, to make the change, right? I'm a 45 year old lady, I'm a 38 year old, you know, school teacher. I'm, a, I'm I, I don't have all the time in the world. Again, I'm not trying to be the next Mr. Olympia, but I want to, I want to put on some muscle. I want to, I want to get fit. What does, what, what, what is my routine? Should, should it look like? How many, how many days in the week? That's the question I get, right? I, I take pictures. Sometimes I'm out on the farm. I'm wearing overalls. People can see I, I have some muscle mass on. And, and, and my backstory, I actually lost the hundred pounds, right. pretty much lost all the muscle that I had built up because I wasn't able to do anything. I've got pictures of me, you know, my arms, you know, look, look like this. And, um, where, where then after adopting a plant-based diet, very, very simply, right. I, I, began doing some resistant strength exercises. I wasn't trying to be Mr. Olympia, but I put on some muscle and I've been able to maintain it. But someone who's wanting to do that, they're starting kind of from a blank slate. How many times a week should they be in the gym? What are some simple, not, not don't you know you give them a routine because I'm sure we've got some great resources we'll get to later uh, that they can get from you. But, but what, what does that time investment look like? And then uh, what, what type of, what type of meals, food should they be eating? Not someone who's trying to put on a hundred pounds. We'll get yeah. to that later, but, yeah. but someone who's just trying to regain their fi fitness. Yeah, absolutely. So we're talking like a 30 to 45 minute commitment, uh, three to five days a week. Obviously it's not just the time invested, but it's the effort invested. I mean, you can go, uh, on a treadmill and be watching the television to the point that you almost fall off the treadmill because you're not paying attention or be on a Stairmaster and looking at your phone while taking steps that are literally look like you're going in slow motion if you were walking on real stairs. Um, these are things to be aware of. And by leaving my phone in the car, oftentimes when I go to the gym, I become aware of these things um, just in the, in the environment around me where there's, there, there are people in the building, but exercise is not always being performed. There's a lot of activity on the, on the cell phone. Um, and that's okay, you know, we all need to keep connected and stay in touch, but, um, but often when we get ourselves to the gym, that should, you know, encourage us to, to actually exercise. Uh, but right now, you know, at least at the time of this recording, gyms are not open during this uh, virus pandemic. And so there's a lot of things you can do out outside or even at home. And so, for example, I've worked out right now uh, six consecutive days, um, just with a pair of dumbbells I've got at home. They're adjustable dumbbells. Uh, but even if I did not have those, I always have my own body weight, my own body mechanics. I've got uh, squats and lunges and crunches and dips and push-ups and all these things that I can do, as well as uh, taking dogs for a walk and, and you know doing that once or twice a day. And and actually, yesterday I went for a nice jog and sprinting in the park with with uh, our littlest dog right over here. And so it's it's really using the resources that you have, but it's making a commitment to do it. So if we can make a commitment to uh, use Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and watch television and all the things that we've come kind of accustomed to or grown accustomed to or even become addicted to in many cases, myself included. And we can make the time to seek out um, healthy meals or cost saving techniques for meals um, and, and take the time to prepare them and enjoy them. Then, you know, we, we can make time of the 1,440 minutes we have each day for a little bit of exercise. We, you know, we're asking for 40 minutes, you know, the other, the other 1,400, whatever you like to do. Uh, and so that's really all it takes. But Gabriel, what, what I found is that once you get started with something, you know, I didn't work out six days in a row just now, uh, you know, it wasn't necessarily planned. It was just that once I started, I gained momentum and I wanted to keep that going because I'd taken a little bit of time off working on a new book and spending a lot of time here in front of the computer. And I wasn't exercising quite as much, to be honest, in the last week or two. And so I realized, you know what, I've got to start now. And by starting, that will give me momentum to be more consistent, which allows adaptation, which improvement is a byproduct of. So it just starts with beginning with something and doing something you enjoy is a big part of it. Hiking, walking, cycling, dancing, uh, weight training, whatever it is, the more you enjoy it, the more likely you are to do it. Great. And, and you, you know, you get, you nailed it there on the, uh, it's just the, the consistency. If you're consistent doing something one time a week and you move up to two times a week, you can be consistent doing it three times a week. And so yeah. just, just normalizing going 
working out or um, using what you've got. I think that's a, a great tip, especially as gyms are closed. We're kind of all dealing with what we have. And in, in particular, I know a lot of the audience, the, the listeners, will probably be those who may be going to the gym and working out with dumbbells as a 69-year-old. Probably not the best first step. Do what you can at home, right? <laughs> Just get moving, go on a walk, yeah. and, and, and realize that, hey, maybe I, I could regain some athleticism. Uh, without without maybe going and buying a gym membership right away uh, is is definitely helpful. So we've so we're we're here. We're we're we've made the commitment. We're someone who's we're we're going to make this step. We're working out at home. We're doing some push ups, doing some body weight squats. We're we just go, we're we're making sure we're exercising thirty minutes a day, forty five minutes a day. We're taking the dog on a walk. We're doing some hiking. We're getting outside, yeah. getting some sunshine, which is important. Yeah, uh, and a wonderful byproduct of it. And we're also here. Here's the question: Is all right. I've lost 50 pounds. I'm at my healthy body weight. I've been eating a whole food plant-based diet for two years now. I don't want to put on 100 pounds of muscle. I'm okay with staying at 190 pounds, 185 pounds. I'm doing the exercises. I'm eating a whole food plant-based diet that's sufficient enough to keep me at this weight. Should I keep doing that? Are there some things that I should do beyond that? Some certain foods that I should be keeping in or cutting out? Um, Or is the diet that I'm eating, a healthy whole food plant-based diet, enough to with the added exercise to make that difference in just looking good at the beach yeah so the 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 main point here gabriel is that uh we need to understand uh, calorie density and nutrient density as well that's a big part of it so obviously if people are following a whole food plant-based diet they're probably in good shape to be avoiding processed foods super calorie dense foods covered in oils and and just the the natural uh, prepackaged foods that are packed full of oil sugar and salt and refined flours and carbohydrates and all of that. But uh, that's not always the case. Uh, even for those of us who, uh, who claim to follow a whole food plant-based diet, um, you know, there's a lot of other food that sneaks in there on, uh, on weekends, on holidays, on parties, on celebrations, on uh, going out to restaurants. I mean, that's, that's part of the whole picture as well. And so part of it is an awareness of that. Uh, it's just like be, being aware of how much water we're consuming. If we know our bodies are 70% water, our brain is 70% water, our muscles are 70% water, and we're not, uh, you like that? There it is, there uh, it is. The screen there. Um, I wore the collared shirt uh, to uh, tone it down a bit. No, just kidding. Um, but uh, if we know that our, our muscles are 70% water, uh, but we're not drinking water, are we really helping ourselves? And so I just want to... Uh, put that out there that, uh, you know, we, we have lots of different titles for our nutrition approaches, you know, mostly whole food diet or a mostly starch focused diet or whole food plant-based diet, but just be aware of the other things that do sneak in because like chef AJ says, you know, if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. So when we're shopping and we're hungry and we bring home these, you know, desserts or pastries or oil rich foods, or even like a bag of fried rice from Trader Joe's, totally vegan and plant-based, but it's about a thousand calories per bag. And I can eat that in about seven and a half minutes. And, and, and craving another one. And so it's really being aware of those things and avoiding those things. But if the diet truly is a whole food plant-based, you know, obviously lots of abundance, lots of volume. And as long as we don't uh, eat a, a surplus in calories beyond what we need, it, it shouldn't you know, be stored as fat. We're, we're using those calories, uh, especially high amounts of complex carbohydrates as fuel for not just exercise. Yeah, people forget that we, we burn calories do, everything. I'm burning calories right now, moving my hands, sitting in this chair, uh, and all throughout our day, uh, taking care of our families or, you know, carrying around baby Bridget or whatever. We're burning calories uh, all these times. And so that fuel is going to be used. And so if you eat, you know, within your calorie range that your body actually requires, you can maintain weight. Well, and then by adding that exercise in, you can start to increase some tone and, and decrease some body fat and, and start to feel and, and look uh, more fit. That's perfect. You know, ladies and gentlemen, if you tuned in and your big question was, or if I've sent you to this video and you've, you've had the question of, oh, I can't go plant-based because I won't be able to get fit or, you know, out of the food or all this stuff, Robert just explained it. Now we're going to get into the more extreme examples of those who want to be a little bit more dedicated, those who want to be, be, you know, really you pack on the muscle. But, but if you are someone, you're just you're me. You're someone who says, you know what, I'm okay with not putting on another 40 pounds of muscle or, or I don't need to look like Mr. Olympia at the beach. I just want to look right. I just don't want to look like a balloon out at the beach, right? Then, uh, 
then what Robert just said was great. And, and, and I'll, I'll just reiterate and, and Robert, if there's anything to add, I always tell people this, if you're, if you're just trying, if you want to just put on some muscle and you're not trying to, to go extreme with it, you want to kind of stay at the same weight, it's making sure you're eating enough calories from whole plant foods and you know, uh, sufficient in calories, right? We're not talking about eating 1200 calories a day as a 200 pound person, but eating a sufficient enough of calories and you're using some resistant strength exercises, probably going to be able to, to do something there. And you've gotten to that point, but now Robert, I want to look, I want to, I, I want to be an eye turner. I want to, I want to go to the beach and people say, what in the world? His arms are as big as the rims on my Prius. You know, I, I, I want, I want to really turn some heads. I want to be dedicated to it. I want to, I, I want to be the next Robert Cheek. What does that look like? Let, let, I mean, what, what does the food look like? What is that training? What is the dedication needed look like? And if you've got some resources for that, we'd love to hear them. And, um, you know, just, Hey, I'm, I'm dedicated. I'm gung ho. I want to be the next, next big vegan bodybuilder. Well, you know, the biggest part is, is mindset. I mean, there's a reason I did uh, over a hundred pushups and 200 crunches a day for 839 consecutive days. And it had nothing to do with building my chest and building my abs. It had everything to do with building habits, building a routine and building discipline that if I could do over a hundred pushups, sometimes way more than that, every single day for years on end without missing a day, no excuses. No, I don't feel well. No, I'm sick. No, I'm traveling. Even before a flight to Sydney, Australia, I was busting them out at the airport. Uh, that, if I can do that, then I can make the time to get to a gym and, and put in a dedicated workout five or six days a week. I can make the time to plan my meals out where I get adequate calories, where I'm in a surplus in order to build muscle combined res with resistance weight training. And I'm dedicated with consistent effort over time. So it adapts and kicks in. And all of a sudden I put on five pounds, put on 10 pounds. I'm getting stronger. I have uh, you know, progressive overload training where I'm, I'm adding more weight, more weight, getting stronger and stronger. Uh, it starts with that kind of mentality where what, what do I want to get out of this and what am I going to put into it? Because as you know, and I'm sure you, you come across this so many times, so many people want 100% return on a 40% investment. And that's just not how it works with fitness. You can try to manipulate it in other areas of life and you know, uh, you know, cheating on an exam or a quiz or a test or whatever and put in a small effort and get a reward that's an artificial you know, uh, thing uh, that's celebrates a you know a, taking a shortcut but you can't do that with health and fitness whether we're talking about losing weight or building muscle you have to put in the work and that's the only way to get to that result so what you have to do is first of all you've got to know how many calories that you require every day a couple of different ways to do that uh, one way I like to do because it's just it's really easy and simple and anyone can do it is to use the Harris Benedict calculator. What this basically does, it's, it's, it's an estimate, but it's pretty good, it's pretty close. But what it does is it takes your basal metabolic rate, uh, how many calories you burn just through existing, just through sitting in this chair, just through lying down, you know, watching the, the Golden Girls on TV, uh, how many calories you burn just through existing, plus your, the calories you expend through any additional activity. Okay, so based on, and, and then it's, it fa so to get to your basal metabolic rate, it's factoring in your gender, age, height, weight, and then you, you include your activity level too, and then it spits out a number. It's gonna say, Robert, you know, you are this, uh, you know, six foot, 212 pound, 40 year old, incredibly handsome, nice beard, individual. Uh, it doesn't actually say Very that. specific, very yeah, specific. If you go to the right website, it might. Uh, it's gonna say, Robert, you, you require 3,150 calories per day to maintain that mass that you have today of, of 212 pounds based on your frame. So what does that mean, Gabriel? It means for me to maintain that, this 212 pounds, I have to eat 3,150 calories every day. Now, again, it's just an estimate because, and the reason why that is, is because many of us are not honest when we fill it out. We, we adjust our height a little bit. We adjust our weight a little bit. We over or underestimate how active we really are when, we, when it asks you if you moderate to intense. Uh, to you know, low intense exercise, high intensity, how many days a week we all you know we kind of round, and, and but it, but it gives you an idea. So that tells me that to maintain weight, I need to eat three thousand one hundred fifty calories per day. So if I want to put on a lot of muscle, I want to get bigger and stronger, compete bodybuilding, powerlifting, or just like you said, look really muscular and fit. I've got to I got to bump that number up. So I might need to eat three thousand five hundred calories uh, every day, 
and allow and over a period of time, weeks and months, and then all of a sudden you can calculate the approximate amount of weight you can expect to add over a, a period of time. Once you consume an excess of X number of thousands of calories, typically about 3,500 calories represents a pound, whether we're gaining or losing, but that has to be a net, you know, accumulated over time, then you can start to make uh, some changes. The other way to determine how many calories that you may require, if you don't want to use the Harris Benedict calculator, which by the way, you can just Google that and punch in some numbers and it's done in 15 seconds. If you want to be truly accurate about yourself is to do what I said earlier, take an entire week and document every single calorie consumed, every ounce of liquid consumed, every minute of exercise and, and, and evaluate it. And then you average out your calorie consumption over the course of those seven days and you realize, okay, I'm eating uh, 2,966 calories per day and I haven't really been gaining or losing weight over the last few weeks or months. I'm kind of staying the same. That's my baseline then, you know? And so either one is going to be a good, uh, a good rule. And those numbers I just made up were pretty, were pretty close, 2,900 and change and 3,100 and change, which is the last time I checked for myself uh, with the harris Benedict calculator. And so those are the pretty similar numbers. And from there, you just adjust your program. So when I wanted to lose weight for bodybuilding, so for perspective, bodybuilders often uh, put on a lot of mass, uh, muscle and fat in, in what they call the off season. Uh, so I would get up to 195 pounds back in the day. That was just what I would peak at, but I would compete at 176 or 172. So I would need to drop 20 pounds. And so I learned how to do that by reducing my calorie consumption or increasing my exercise expenditure, especially cardiovascular training and ideally, in a fat burning zone, such as uh, post weight training workout, doing cardiovascular training, or on an empty stomach where you're calling upon uh, stored fat to burn as fuel rather than glycogen that's available in, uh, in muscles to, to burn from carbohydrate. So once you understand that, you can control, and this is really cool, and this is what I write about in, in, in all my books, is that you have actually control over whether you're gonna gain weight or lose weight at any time because you're aware of every calorie, every ounce of liquid, and, and every minute of exercise, and guess what? You don't have to write it down all the time. You do this for a week or two, or a month, it, it becomes second nature. It becomes part of your new routine, your new normal. Uh, your, your behaviors become your habits, and that's a reflection of who you are. You are a sum of what you spend your time doing. And so uh, it, it's been incredible to, to have that control for so many years and to watch other people embrace that about themselves and become the next great vegan bodybuilder and the, the next great vegan fitness competitor, male, male or female in a variety of sports. It's, it's, it's understanding how to put yourself in that position, having the mindset to do it, the initial willpower to get going, and then allowing consistency to make it become second nature for you. That's awesome and, and, and very helpful. And that, that's, the, that's the kind of the key to a lot of things. Well, how do I get here? Well, you got to know where to start. <laughs> and unless you know what your current expenditure is and intake is and current lifestyle is, you can't figure out how much you need to get to where, you, to where you're going to go. And that's extremely helpful, extremely helpful. So you know you have these. So I, I'm gung-ho. I'm, I'm dedicating the time. Mm -hmm. I've, taken, I've taken the weeks to do it. But Robert, I, uh, you know, I, I go on YouTube, I look up bodybuilding, I see Phil Heath, Ronnie Coleman, Dexter Jackson, you know, yeah. Arnold, I see all these guys. And, and yeah, so, so first of all, ladies and gentlemen, let's just make this clear. You're not going to be Mr. Olympia <laughs> in the open category or go and win in the Arnold in the open category without the help of performance enhancing drugs. We're not going to get 330 pounds and 6% fat, right, without without the help of some PEDs. And so that's not what we're talking about. That's not what we're focusing on. We're talking about natural bodybuilding here. Um, that's, that's Robert's specialty. And so we're, we're, not, we're not talking about that part of things, but we are talking about maximizing human potential without you know, performance enhancement. So, so here, here's the question, but I do see those guys. I see Ronnie Coleman. I, you know, if you grew up a bodybuilding fan, you, you know all the guys. You know, yeah. Kai Green, you know, all the, but all they eat, seven, eight, 10 times a day, chicken and rice, chicken and rice, chicken and sweet potatoes, chicken and rice. Robert, I, you say I need 3000 calories. I, I want to be the next, you know, next great bodybuilder. What do I eat? Because those guys eat two things and they look like that. What should I eat? Well, I want to, I want to tell you a couple things. One, I, I've met every single person you just mentioned uh, from Arnold to Ronnie to Phil and, and everyone else. And I, I will tell you uh, that 
they, they, in many cases, did eat that way, but aren't necessarily doing that right now. Uh, case in point, uh, last I heard, Phil Heath said he was eating something like 70% uh, vegan. And, and from what I understood, his wife was fully vegan or mostly vegan. And he even wrote himself on Instagram comments saying that he eats a mostly vegan diet these days. And he was saying that a couple years ago, uh, right when, when he uh, finished up winning, I think, seven consecutive Mr. Mm -hmm. Olympia titles. Uh, he was saying that. I was actually in Vegas for the Olympia uh, when he was posting some of that that stuff. And, uh, and, and of course, you probably know with, with Arnold, he's eating a predominantly plant-based these days. He's certainly not vegan. Um, he says that openly and clearly, but he eats a lot of vegan food and mostly, uh, and mostly plant-based these days because he's had some heart issues. And we know, you know, Ronnie, um, very, very hardcore trainer, but also, uh, I mean, he lifted so, so much weight. And, uh, but also very, 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 very poor nutritional diet, and he has had all kinds of health complications in recent years. So I just wanted to mention that, yes, these guys. And I uh, should say, you know, chicken and rice, but with Ronnie, it was chicken and rice and then like 90% Casey Masterpiece barbecue sauce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> That's a Ronnie Coleman impersonation for those who don't know. But so I just want to make that clear that because, Gabriel, I, I'm at all these, uh, the biggest fitness events in the world these days with a vegan strong booth. I'm there at the Olympia. I'm there at the Arnold. Uh, many of these guys have come up to my booth. I've been, I've signed books for these guys, my, my vegan fitness books for guys that I used to have their posters on my wall, you know, uh, Chris Cormier uh, and, and others who are now leaning more towards a plant-based diet because they've had a lot of trouble uh, with a high animal protein diet. And also, you know, unfortunately there's many, uh, many famous bodybuilders that are no longer around. Many I, I, mm -hmm. I met, had, had photos with, were, were great guys to talk to and hang around, um, uh, and who unfortunately passed at, sometimes in their late 30s or early 40s uh, because of organ failure, heart disease, uh, heart attack, stroke, uh, diet-related things that maybe a performance enhancing drugs may have played a, a role in some of that, but certainly at the end of the day, uh, you know, arteries uh, closed up and blood could no longer flow to the body and, and they unfortunately are no, no longer. And so a lot of bodybuilders are waking up to that, that there are some, there are tremendous benefits of consuming a plant-based diet. And I think people are starting to realize now, or I know so, including major bodybuilders, that you can reach your calorie intake needs uh, on a totally plant-based diet. So your question was, so what do you eat if you want to gain a lot of mass? What kind of foods do you eat? Well, you eat the ones that are the most calorie dense, the most calorie rich foods. And there's this whole calorie density scale, which on one far end is leafy green vegetables at 60 to 100 calories per pound. I mean, virtually no, no, nothing, no calories there. On the other end is, is oil at 4,000 calories per pound of, of pure fat. So we're talking about like a 40 fold difference here, 100 to 4,000. And along the way, you get fruits and vegetables that are 200, 300 calories per pound. I mean, not very calorie dense. But then you get into some other starchy vegetables like potatoes and you get into some grains and uh, oats and rice and things like that. And you get into about 500 calories per pound and legumes, 600 calories per pound. You go up to nuts and seeds, believe it or not, 25 to 2,800 calories per pound for nuts and seeds, therefore nut butters and all of those things. Uh, are, are tremendous for adding adding mass. So what you really have to do is, is understand that nobody is, is built by kale. Uh, you can get a lot of nutrition from kale. Uh, you can get some great uh, benefits from leafy greens. We know that plants have uh, 64 times more antioxidants than animal foods do. We know that only plants contain fiber and that 97% of Americans don't consume enough fiber. We know that dietary cholesterol only comes from animal protein and it's not found in and uh, in a plant-based diet, and that is an Achilles heel to many, many Americans dealing with cholesterol, not enough fiber, not enough antioxidants. So it's great to include uh, lots of leafy greens and lots of salads, but you're not going to put on any muscle. You're not going to put on any mass. You'll get your micronutrients that way, but you've got to have sweet potatoes. You've got to have lentils. You've got to have garbanzo beans. You've got to have brown rice. You've got to have some almond butter. That's the way you're going to do it. And and I lived that way. I, mean, I, I, I had a fully documented everything, you know, 5,000 calorie diet for a while uh, on a, on a plant-based diet. And there were nut butters, there were lots of beans, there were lots of potatoes. There were, I mean, you think about some of these meals. Okay. Think about this for a minute. A bowl of oatmeal, 
about 500 calories per pound, right? You can eat a lot of oatmeal. I mean, a lot of water makes the volume really high, but it's, you know, it's easy to eat a lot of it. But once you put things like berries for high antioxidants and 300 calories per pound on top, and then nuts, like walnuts, almonds, whatever you like, uh, sprinkled on top, or even more than sprinkled, quite a few nuts in there, that's 2,800 calories per pound, and you're obviously not eating a pound, but per handful, you could be talking to hundreds of calories per handful. And now this oatmeal, instead of being like this, breakfast of a couple hundred calories from fruit you know you could have a thousand calorie breakfast and that's of course recommended for people who are trying to gain weight trying to gain muscle not for people who are losing weight of course and the same with lunch i mean look at uh, my one of my favorite things to eat is a burrito bowl so we're talking a base of brown rice and pinto beans and black beans and avocado and then the heavy foods then some lighter ones like lettuce tomato and you know, salsa or peppers or mushrooms or whatever you want to put on top. But the foundation is super, you know, calorie dense and also fairly nutrient rich as well. And then we haven't even talked about the most important or most uh, not important, but popular bodybuilding foods for uh, plant-based individuals, which are things like tofu and tempeh, and uh, and seitan for those who can stomach it. I it never really sat well with me, so uh, no seitan for me. It would make me. You know, super bloated and gassy and uncomfortable. But things like tofu and tempeh were a huge part of my bodybuilding life. So much so that now I don't even like them that much. I don't even I don't even care for them that much because uh, I mean I hate so much of it. I'm I'm kind of you know, I'm I'm bored. Yeah, I'm, I'm tired of. It. I want to eat something different now. So I gravitate more towards whole plant foods now and, and a lot of diversity there. But uh, but anyway, to answer, to answer your question. You can, that's the thing, you can still be a, uh, a Mr. Olympia bodybuilder. In fact, um, I interviewed Tony Freeman more than 10 years ago, I want to say. Uh, I don't, do you remember him, the X-Man, Tony Freeman? Vaguely, vaguely. Okay, so he was t- like six foot five, 300 pounds, ripped. He won multiple shows. He was a top 10 Mr. Olympia competitor during the time when Ronnie was winning and Jay Cutler was winning. Uh, he, his parents were, were vegan. In fact, they leaned towards raw food vegan. He was dabbling into veganism. And this is like 2009. I was filming a documentary about plant-based athletes that never got completed, but people have been doing this for a long time. They just, they just don't, it doesn't always make muscle magazine headlines because muscle magazines are designed to sell whey protein and casein protein, and they're beholden to their sponsors. Uh, I've been friends with Jay Cutler for, uh, almost 20 years now. Met him when I was 21 on my birthday, actually. Same time I first met Arnold for the first time. That's 20 years ago, because I'm 40 now. And Jay Cutler has been well aware of veganism for a long time. I just saw him a few few months ago, uh, January. And you know, we, we talked about it then. And, and he's, you know, he's, not, he's not vegan himself, but he is well aware of reducing his animal protein consumption to a kind of a you know, level that's not going to create the, the, the fate that so many of his colleagues had, which was early mortality and he's been an earlier adopter than many other bodybuilders about in, in, increasing more plant-based foods and guys like phil heath and others have, have been doing more of that um uh i mentioned chris cormier and um uh, who am i trying to think of there's another one i just signed a book for him uh i forget off, off the top of my head but but anyway more and more people are doing it and now you see Nimai and tori washington and natalie matthews and many people competing at a high level on a plant-based diet and they just basically, they understood nutrient density and calorie density, put it together in a winning recipe, and there we have it. It's perfect. No, I, I uh, <laughs> so much great, great stuff there, especially for our, uh, for our viewers who, yeah, I think of myself, you know, I'm, I don't come from a bodybuilding background. I didn't ever compete in bodybuilding, but I come from a, a strength background and we're playing you know, division one college football. And I get asked a lot of times, Oh, or by parents, oh, my son wants to do this. We're eating whole food plant-based, but I worry they won't be able to do this or they won't be able to do that. And really just the question, and, and you, you really brought it together there is, is as long as they're eating enough calories from whole plant foods, right? There's, there's the common myths and you see them, I'm sure of the, those images you'll see of, of the protein in broccoli or the protein in kale. And, and people say, oh, look at that. Well, sure, the gorilla can, can be 300 pounds of muscle, but I don't think you're going to spend the next eight years, 18 hours a day eating kale. And, you know, it's, so there are, some, there are some myths out there, but, yeah. but demystifying is really just to say you're eating enough calories, you're utilizing the right exercises, 
in your case or in, in an athletic case, resistance, strength, exercises, building muscle masses is important. And, and beyond that, there's, you can get as intricate as you'd like. And if you're really focused on it, you should get, you know, really focused on the fine details. But, um, but I do get asked that question a lot. And so it's nice to, nice to hear that, especially from the extreme sense of saying, you, know, you really want to go after it. It's really not that it is complicated, but at the, as an outlook onlooker, not that, uh, not that crazy. Um, and here's, here's a question that I did have is, and I kind of touched on one there, but what are some myths about vegan bodybuilding? Some common ones you hear all the time, ones that I think, or ones that you can think of that get spread around all the time, positive or negative, that uh, would, be, would be helpful to our viewers. Yeah, I mean, one I actually just answered in an interview through email earlier this morning before this, before this call, which was that, you know, vegans can't build muscle. And that must mean I don't exist then because uh, I put on 100 pounds uh, over the past 25 years. I mean, my 25th year now is a plant-based athlete. And a lot of that uh, muscle was put on in a, in a short amount of time between like age 20 and 25 and then, you know, packed on more in my 30s and that kind of thing. So there's this idea that somehow is still – getting spread that you can't build your body on a plant-based diet. You can't build muscle. Yet there's thousands and thousands and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, I mean, look on social media alone, of people who are doing it. So this is just, this myth just doesn't hold any water. It can't, it, it, it can't be true because we're living, breathing representatives, people who've been doing this um, for a very long time. Uh, there's this myth about incomplete protein that you can't get uh, complete protein eating plants or eating whole food plant-based without protein supplementation or isolated nutrients. And that's just not how n nutritional science works. I mean, we use amino acids that we collect from, from all types of foods and pool together and they work in a very harmonious and holistic and intricate way inside the body. And so you pull from one area from another and, and certain amino acids uh, or certain foods have higher amounts of some amino acids, certain foods have lower amounts of others, and they, they complement one another. And and they don't have to be consumed in one particular meal, like lunchtime with rice and beans or a breakfast that's, you know, with all these different things added to it together or dinner that's comprehensive and complicated. It has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with that at all. And so a complete protein is easily found in a plant-based diet as long as there's adequate calories consumed. Uh, of course, it's possible to, um, to build muscle on a plant-based diet. Uh, people often want to say that uh, that soy is is scary or soy is bad for you, you know, because it has some estrogen-like properties. Yet these are the same people as as grown adults who are still breastfeeding, consuming cow's milk. They're they're literally breastfeeding uh, in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and they're eating chicken breasts. I mean, hello, we're just eat, we're just consuming breasts full of estrogen, uh, drinking, um, you know, drinking from udders. Uh, we're, we're breastfeeding as adults and we're scared of a piece of tofu in our salad. Like, I mean, this is, it's mind boggling uh, when you really think about some of these things. People are, people are, another myth is that, oh, this, this, uh, I don't know, this Franken food, you know, like a, like a tofu hot dog, you know, like there, what kind of things are, are put into that? Yet a regular hot dog has like pig anus in it and, and all kinds of scraps from different animals all put together in, a, in something that the World Health Organization and, and, and many others have considered a, a, a carcinogen, something that is very likely and probable to cause cancer and has closely uh, related links to uh, uh, colorectal cancer and, uh, and prostate cancer and other forms of cancer. Um, yet we're afraid of a, uh, a plant-based burger that was made in a lab, yet you and I know, because we come from an animal agriculture perspective, that all kinds of antibiotics and additives and supplements, uh, B12 and all these things are fed to, to animals in their, in, their, in their feed. And so whatever animal-based patty you're getting is not just this um, you know, organically grown, you know, super natural flesh of, of this cow out in a pasture, it's very, very unlikely to be that. Um, and it comes with all the other things too. It comes with the cholesterol and often saturated fat, and it comes with a tremendous amount of resources used to, uh, to destroy land, to raise crops, to raise cattle, to uh, slaughter cattle and other animals and transport them and, 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 and harvest them and refrigerate and freeze them and package them and all these things. And so, you know, I, I think there's just a lot of, a lot of fear out there that, uh, that people want to justify their own bad behaviors. We've always wanted to do that, 
right? When we were kids, we did that. We were, I remember my neighbor was talking about the benefits of hand-eye coordination playing Super Nintendo. So his, his mom would let him play. And we, we justify that, well, I'm, you know, I don't need to do my homework because I'm going to be in the NBA someday. That was me. I never made it. Um, I, we, we justify, well, I've got to be on Instagram 10 hours a day because I, I, I'm, I'm an influencer. I run my personal brand. Well, you know, what if that platform shuts down tomorrow? Who are you? Where are you? Um, you know, all these kind of things. And so we do it with nutrition. We do it with, with uh, scapegoating uh, veganism or plant-based diet because it's something that either intimidates us, that we, uh, we, we, we feel threatened by it. Um, it's, it's changing the way that we've eaten or what we've always known or what, we've, or what my you know, family grew up raising animals and all that. We, we fear change. Uh, we don't want to embrace it. And so we find excuses to say that, no, no, uh, this food is totally fine. It has no link to chronic obesity and increased mortality rates throughout the, the Western world. Uh, it's, it's, the animals don't mind. Uh, you know, we, we have all these ideas in our heads that justify our actions. And I think those contribute to the myths that are out there that either you can't be healthy, you can't build muscle, you, you, uh, you know, soy is bad for you, whatever the case is. So those are just some of them. But like I said, from the very beginning, I think one of the best things we can do is, is just lead by example and, uh, and, and do the best that we can to represent a plant-based diet in a really positive way. And from there, we, we get to introduce it to people who maybe would have otherwise never given it a shot. Awesome. And it's, it's so funny how, or whatever, whatever um, test tube or Petri dish we find ourselves in, it could be football, it could be bodybuilding, it could be education, it could be all these things. It's weird how there's like three or four of the same myths. Oh, you're a vegan math teacher. You don't get enough protein. And they'll say the exact same thing gets said to a vegan bodybuilder. And um, it's amazing how, how, how far fetched or how far reaching those, uh, those myths are, but, but they are there. And, and I, I, personally was one that helped help help them go far reaching right as a as an athlete who would who would you know scoff at vegans or you know oh, you can't get enough protein or as as a livestock production major as someone who was helping to prolificate or you know proliferate that that belief uh, spreading it out kind of like probably what your dad was doing like t colin campbell did for a lot of his time yeah. um in education or, or higher education and so uh, but what we're doing now is is we're hoping to write the ship. We're hoping to write the ship. Um, I have one more question before before we kind of get into some of the resources that, uh, sure. that hopefully you'll be able to provide with with our viewers. Um, here here's one that I in, in that I have, and I'm sure others have because I know I've talked to others uh, who may be casual or you know, bodybuilding fans. Is be, when we talk about bodybuilding fans, we all if you if you are a bodybuilding fan, you understand that, hey, you don't get to be there. There's, there's natural bodybuilding. And then there's what you see at Mr. Olympia open or the Arnold open. And, and so here, here's the question and, and I've not had it answered. And I think you're the perfect person to, to hopefully help us get to, to an answer is given all keeping all things constant, right? Not saying it's healthy and not saying it's good for long-term, long-term health. So I'm not recommending it, yeah. but if I was a 18, 17 year old, who wanted to get into bodybuilding and said, Mr. Olympia, the open title, I want to be the next Phil Heath. I want to be the next Jay Cutler. I want to be this Ronnie Coleman. If that was my goal, given all things constant, meaning that I was going to not recommending it, but I was going to do the performance enhancement that was needed, right? We don't need to get into what it is, but it's needed <laughs> to be 300 pounds and four or five, 6% muscle, you know, uh, fat up on the body. There's, there are things that are, that are needed to get there. All those things constant. If I was eating a whole food, plant-based diet, a vegan diet, is it possible keeping everything else constant, just changing diet? It is. It is. And, and history tells us that. So uh, going back quite a few years, uh, we know there was, uh, and I'm going to progress here because I'm going to start with a vegetarian guy named Bill Pearl. Many people know he used to actually beat Arnold Schwarzenegger on stage. And Bill Pearl was a vegetarian for decades. And this is back like in the um, 60s. Uh, he wasn't eating any, any meat at all, but you know, he was still doing, from what I understand, some dairy protein, whey protein. So we'll scratch Bill Pearl for a minute, but he certainly opened up a lot of doors and said, hey, you can be, and he was Mr. Universe. He was, you know, Mr. America. He was Mr. Universe. He won major titles, one of the best bodybuilders in the world. He's an absolute legend. Uh, actually, I got a photo with him uh, 10 years ago when I competed at his event, which is out in Central Oregon. And uh, then, so then there's Andres Colling uh, from Sweden 
He was Mr. Universe. He won all kinds of awards. And he was known as a longtime vegetarian and possibly vegan. I, uh, I haven't had the top opportunity to meet him in person, although we've been at the events at the same times. He's now 60s, must be in his 60s, mid 60s somewhere. But I've, you know, he's been at the Olympia and such when I've been there, but haven't met him. But he was a star in the 70s and 80s as a vegan or vegetarian, Mr. Universe, you know, top bodybuilder in the world. Um, Barney Duplessis, I was just emailing with him today. Uh, he won the Mr. Universe title. He's in the UK. He won the Mr. Universe title, uh, I don't know, four years ago or so, five years ago. And he's a totally vegan guy, plant-based guy. In fact, he's like a you know, pretty hardcore animal rights vegan guy, um, that tattoo artist, really big guy. Uh, I was just emailing with him today. Uh, Billy Simmons, a friend of mine from Australia, he won Mr. Universe title as a vegetarian and has been vegan ever since. I think he probably went vegan the very next year. Uh, so now I've mentioned lots of Mr. Universe and Mr. America and these things. What about Olympia, right? <laughs> That's the big question. So there, and there is a- 285 pounds of pure muscle walking up on stage. That's right. the and question, is, yeah. And, and there is a little bit of a difference there, although Mr. Universe uh, is an amazing title and Mr. World and Mr. America. Those are, those are not, I mean, you have to be in the top 1% of the top 1% to, you know, to, to get there. I mean, that's, that has to be understood. But there also is another level with the Olympia, which is the best of the best uh, of everybody in the whole world. And I've already mentioned uh, Tony Freeman did quite well with a mostly vegan diet, finishing in the top 10 at the Olympia. Again, I don't know if it was fully, completely fully plant-based or not. Um, uh, Phil Heath has talked about doing uh, a mostly 70% vegan diet. He's one of the best bodybuilders in the history of the world. And he was talking about this, you know, right at his prime or at least towards the end of his prime. I mean, I specifically remember he was talking about it right when he finished second to Sean Roden. I actually thought he was going to win that one, but it was the last Olympia that he did two years ago. And he was talking about being plant-based then in the Instagram comments when people were asking him questions. And, uh, and then you have Kai Green. Uh, who, um, you know, I don't, I don't uh, believe he's fully plant-based. You know, he, he, uh, you may be familiar. He, he was asking questions on Instagram about a plant-based diet, uh, you know, surveying people, trying to get some information and literally six days later, released an ebook about it. <laughs> and that he's a lifelong of, vegan, six days. He knew everything. <laughs> that's all kinds of controversy, of course. Um, you know, he has 5 million Instagram followers or 6 million and so people were we're pumped in the plant-based world that the most popular probably bodybuilder in the world had adopted a plant-based diet, but uh, some questioned the sincerity of it. But still, uh, you know, he, I talked to one of his good friends who lives in LA at the LA Fit Expo, which Kai was also at. And he said, no, no, I really believe Kai is doing it. Um, and that he's been doing it for some time. In fact, a month or so before he posted that he was asking questions about it, he had already been doing it and he was just kind of hyping up his ebook thing. But so the point is, uh, I, I wholeheartedly believe that you can. And, and look at the success that so many other people uh, have had in the vegan bodybuilding world, including Tori Washington, who competed at the Arnold in the, uh, it wasn't the drug tested one, the natural one, but, but he competed in, at the Arnold. Um, Nimai Delgado, who's been competing at the IFBB level for a while now. From what I understand, he's not planning on competing anymore. He's built like, a great brand for himself and he's in the game changers and he's, you know, he's, he's got all kinds of projects going on and I think he might be done with competing, but he had a lot of success. And yes, I, I really do believe. So uh, who, Brandon Curry, I think, is the reigning Mr. Olympia champion, um, Sean Roden before that, and uh, Phil Heath before that, and Ronnie before that, that yeah, you absolutely could. Um, all things being equal, Again, we're not, neither one, make it absolutely clear, neither one of us are suggesting you use performance enhancing drugs or anything like that. Or even, I don't even know what they look like. Never seen them in my entire life. But if someone were to use all of those things, but eat an actual plant-based diet versus animal protein, could they achieve the status of the greatest bodybuilder in the world? I wholeheartedly believe they could. That's great. I, I, I'm, I'm so glad you got, we, we, we have that answer. I've been, you know, I've, I've asked a lot of people, not as, not as no knowing or uh, as understood in the, the bodybuilding community, that question. And, you know, there's a lot of different answers, but, uh, but I would, I would agree with you. I would say that there's a lot of, you know, the diet is one part and um, you know, you focus on, focus on what you can control there, but that was, that was a great answer. Um, Robert, here, here's the, here's the question. We've, we've been, we've been talking for 45 minutes or so here. If I've, if you're still listening, 
go ahead and hit the like button because you've enjoyed it so far. Hit that like button. But, but if you have enjoyed it so far and you've, you've really enjoyed what Robert's been talking about, what are some resources you have? You talked about the potential of a new book. I know you have three books, I'm pretty sure, published right now. Yep. Um, but so give us, you've got the three books. So who should buy what book? Say there, you know, there's Shred It, there's uh, Vegan Bodybuilding Fitness. What stage of life or where people should be for what books? Because I'm a huge believer in reading. I'm a huge believer in books. And so you've got a, a whole library that you've written pretty much on, on the topic. So how you give us give us the people that should be reading this book and that book, and then let us know about your future projects. Yeah, thanks, Gabriel. And I'm you know I'm really uh, fortunate to be in this position where I've been doing this for so long. I've been living a plant based athlete lifestyle for 25 years. You know, from age 15 to 40, so I've experienced a lot. I've been a champion runner. I've been a multi time champion bodybuilder. I competed at the 2006 Natural Bodybuilding World Championships. I've got you know. Uh, some amazing before and after transformations from long distance runner to champion bodybuilder. And, and I, and I live that stuff. And a lot of it has to do with mindset and work ethic and drive and passion. And then everything falls into place. So I think what I would mostly recommend is my book shred it. And the reason why I say that number one, it's a whole food guide to building muscle uh, on a plant-based diet. So I'm not talking about sports supplements in that book. I'm not talking about processed foods in that book. That book has been endorsed by Dr. T. Colin Campbell, uh, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, um, Rich Roll, Brian Wendell, who produced Forks Over Knives, Rip, Rip Esselstyn, uh, Kathy Freston, Juliana Hever, registered dietitian, um, all kinds of experts, 28 world-renowned experts. It was, uh, it was my second book and the one that I think has resonated with people the most because, for one, it's a whole food approach. We're not selling anything. We're not selling supplements. We're not selling uh, – anything else it's we're selling we're the information is there you know and, th and that's a, that has the really detailed chapters about harris benedict calculator and equation and understanding what your true calorie needs are and how to get into effective fat burning zones how to build muscle and how to do it without all the hype without, without all the marketing and the sales of this packaged protein powder and that may or may not make a difference for you or all these other supplements that may or may not make a difference um you know there could be that some supplements are, are helpful but uh Certainly, uh, a whole food approach is the most nutrient dense and diverse and sufficient way that we know to eat that's just natural in our environment that naturally contains the vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, phytonutrients, water, fiber in its whole state. And it, it's a book that's helped so many people. It features 36 other plant based athletes in there. There are case studies, success stories transformation stories before and after P other people who like you have lost over a hundred pounds. There's one woman, um, uh, uh, Trisha in the book, um, Tr now Byers cause she got married, um, recently. So Trisha Byers. Congratulations, Trisha. <laughs> yeah. She was, uh, so she was about 300 pounds and she got down to, uh, something like 135 pounds and is now a fitness instructor. Um, and she's even been a fitness model and used in, in advertisements and marketing and all that as, as someone who's a successful plant-based athlete. And, and here's someone who's at one time, just about 300 pounds, 290 to one to 135 or so. And that's just one example. Another woman lost over hundred pounds. Uh, another uh, individual lost over hundred. Uh, other people gained incredible muscle uh, and became champion bodybuilders. And so uh, Shredded just really tells those stories along with, you know, 75 recipes and meal plans and exactly what to eat and when and all that kind of stuff. So I think Shredded's a great one. Um, if people want to see anything I've done since then, Plant Based Muscle, which I co authored with Vanessa Espinoza. So it's more of a male and female perspective, but it's more of a, uh, what I would say, a day in the life. It's like okay. a summary of, you know, Vanessa is a, an, an amazing plant based athlete, one of the best in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was an uh, All-American basketball player, drafted into the WNBA, went on to be become a three-time Colorado State Golden Gloves boxing champion, and then turned powerlifter. In her first powerlifting meet, nearly set a world record, in her very first meet, competed at the Olympia in powerlifting, won, to the best of my knowledge, every single powerlifting competition she's ever been in, and has been vegan for about 20 years. And super compassionate. Uh, she, we work out together. Uh, and now that I'm back in Colorado and once we can start interacting again, we'll be working out together again. And she uses more than hundred pound dumbbells for, for chest presses. You know, she can press 110 pound dumbbells and deadlift over 400 pounds and squat 365 pounds and uh, bench press 245. And she weighs 130 pounds. 
And uh, anyway, uh, she's, she's an absolute great trainer. And so we talk about achieving your plant-based health and fitness goals, you know, from a male and female perspective in that book. And then the one I'm really excited about I'm writing right now is called The Plant-Based Athlete. And it's a big project. I've been working on this one for years. And uh, it should be coming out uh, about a year from now, sometime in the spring of 2021. And this one is aimed to be um, kind of like your book, super mainstream, how to approach, how anyone can be a plant-based athlete. And so lots of athlete uh, stories from famous uh, world champion Olympic successful athletes, as well as a fundamental program about how to understand for anybody, just a totally mainstream person who's walking through a bookstore and who just, oh, that's an interesting topic, plant-based athlete, and who can easily understand nutrient density, calorie density, individual calorie needs, the role that exercise plays in health and fitness, the role that whole foods versus processed foods play, what supplements may or may not be uh, included into a healthy diet, and something that people can apply right away with um, evidence-based research and uh, celebrity athletes as, as uh, you know, influence, uh, influential people or motivating factors or inspirational stories. And, and then I've got a co-author in Matt Frazier from No Meat Athlete. And uh, it's a it's been a nice uh, collaboration. So that's something to look forward to down the road. Well, so uh, and, and and then lastly, I've been running veganbodybuilding.com for almost twenty years. Not super tech savvy. The site doesn't get as updated as I'd like, um, but it is doing. It's involved in an overhaul right now in in twenty twenty. So I've been running that website for almost two decades. A lot of great resources there. And then veganstrong.com is where I'm on my uh, national speaking tour and. Whenever we are able to travel again, that's where I go to the Olympia, the Arnold, with a team of vegan athletes and set up a booth with Vegan Strong and, and, uh, and distribute literature and information and have conversations and distribute plant-based products to people uh, who are totally new to this lifestyle. And it's a way that we can grow awareness about the vegan fitness lifestyle within the mainstream fitness culture. Awesome. Well, Robert, I, uh, and where, where can we find you on Instagram and Facebook and you know, any of your social media channels? Where can we find yeah, you there? So I'm, uh, Robert Cheek, just like your face, but with an E on the end and uh, vegan bodybuilding and fitness. So if you just look up those things, you'll find me at, at robert.cheek on Instagram and Robert Cheek on Facebook, Robert Cheek on Twitter and vegan bodybuilding and fitness. I have kind of a personal uh, page and a brand page for every platform. So uh, you can find me there. I'm, I'm relatively involved and engaged on those platforms, especially with my travels and especially with a lot of the things that I, I like to promote like vegan strong and spread the word about that lifestyle and, uh, and promote things like your book, which I ordered right away, by the way, uh, my wife's a big fan. And, uh, in fact, she's the one that told me about you a long time ago. She loves your chocolate sweet potato pudding or something like that. And, and I got the book for, for the holidays for her and, and all that. So, uh, anyway, she, she says hi too, cause she's been a fan for a long time. Well, you tell her I said hello, and, and, our, and our, our hope our audience uh, f goes over there and uh, checks out all your pages. Mm -hmm. I would highly recommend, right, Shred, it's a great one. And then if you look at uh, Robert's most, the, the recent one with Vanessa, all you need to do is just look at the cover and say, do I want to look like that? And if the answer is yes, go ahead and buy the book. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's just a great, uh, a great great view, models of what uh you know a vegan diet can really be long-term vegans right nothing wrong with people who have gone vegan six days ago or six weeks ago that are now promoting it but but really that proof is in those people that have been doing it like yourself and vanessa and uh, many others for decades upon decades uh, living healthy long lives but also reaching peak athletic performance which is it's it's what we need to see it's what what we need out there so robert Thank you so very much, everyone. If you have enjoyed today's video, go ahead and share it uh, and hit the like button and tag someone that you think would find it helpful. I'm gonna tag a few people because I know a lot of folks that are gonna find this helpful. And then also, if you have any questions or suggestions, make sure you leave them in the comment section below and we will be back with another video, picture, post very, very soon. Robert, thanks for tuning in and we will see you all very soon.